Okay, Th Sorry. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's good. Uh, and as usual, probably it's better to mute your mics because otherwise uh, we're gonna we're gonna have some background noise. Uh, and but of course, please ask questions whenever whenever you want, either in the chat or unmute yourself. So so how to do it for uh, for any G compact independently of the type? And um, there are two routes or at least two routes that we're gonna present in this mini course. So one of them goes via Poisson-Only groups and tropicalization. Maybe, I, as I suggest, please mute yourself, everybody who is not speaking at the moment, and that, uh, that, that would avoid extra noises. So, um, so plus only groups and tropicalization. And the um, other route is by uh, toric degenerations. So we'll spend most of the time on Poisson-only groups and tropicalization, but tomorrow also Jeremy will be talking about toric degenerations. So we'll see both methods. Now uh, I will be talking about Poisson-only groups and tropicalization today. And uh, you see, we want to do um, other types, not UN, not SUN, but uh, it's a bit strange, but still we're gonna have our examples. Uh, this would be mainly uh, either SU2 or U3. Of course, for those examples, we already know everything, but to illustrate the method, it's still better to, to look at some simple examples and other examples, they are too cumbersome to present. So uh, don't get confused by that. We, we want to do, but we want to do methods which work for all types. Okay, so um, part four. Was only groups. And here, let me just uh, remind the standard definitions. Suppose that G is the connected Lee group, let's say the real Lee group. And uh, suppose that it has a Poisson structure. So then uh, the definition. So this pair G by G. Is a Poisson Lee group. If the product map of G is Poisson. Um, perhaps that's of course very standard. Perhaps two remarks. Uh, this implies that uh, the Poisson bracket at the group unit vanishes. And it also implies that the inversion map is actually on type Poisson. So in fact, the more logical definition of Poisson only groups would be that all structure maps, meaning the multiplication map and the inversion are Poisson, but this is not possible because those conditions simply contradict each other. So we do a compromise, uh, the multiplication map is Poisson, and then it this, this condition implies that the inversion is anti-Poisson. Um, so actually we are interested in a particular situation when uh, G is uh, compact, and then let's denote as usual by T the maximal torus. And the Lie algebra of the maximal torus will be this, whatever, beautiful T. So then, uh, in fact, there is a classification of all Poisson Lie structures. I don't know whether you are familiar with it. So this is due to 
Lewandowski and Soibonen about 30 years ago. Uh, and it says the following, that up to conjugation, so you can always apply conjugation and induce some other Poisson structure, but up to conjugation, Poisson Lee structures on G are classified by elements of the following space. So this is a vector space R plus veg two of T. In particular here, there is a sort of distinguished element one zero. And this is called the standard, the standard uh, Poisson Lee structure. And uh, in fact, this is related, this is induced by the Dreamfield Gym Bill. By the Dreamfield Gym quantum group. Uh, in fact, I don't want to describe this pi standard. Probably most of you know what it is. If you don't know, the, 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 there will be somewhat equivalent description very soon. So, but we, we need to know that, uh, let's say essentially, uh, um, so this, this is not a very, very important factor. So in fact, they're all more or less the same. So the only thing is this R, which is the scaling. So you can multiply this pi standard by something. And we will restrict our attention to the standard Poisson the structure on compact groups. Okay. So um, let me now explain something which is called Poisson Lee duality. Well, um, we have a Lee bracket. We have a Lee bracket of G. And let's consider the Taylor expansion of uh, by G. At the group unit. So, um, how does it look like? It looks like that. Uh, it is an element in the following space. So, these are polynomials uh, on the tangent space. So, polynomials on uh, uh, polynomials on G times h to g because this is a bivector and uh, so the Taylor expansion is the zeros order plus the first order term plus second order term plus blah 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 but we already know that the zero order term is zero right that's uh, that's because of this consideration so the Poisson bracket vanishes at the group unit now, uh, where does it leave this uh, pi one? Uh, pi one leaves in uh, a G star tends the uh, to G and you can trade it for a map from G to which to G, right? Let's denote it Delta. And you can dualize that map into a map from which G star to G star. Uh, so it turns out that this map, let's denote it bracket star, is a Lie bracket. So this is a consequence of the Jacobi identity uh, for the Poisson bracket pi g. And so this follows 
شما چی کار دارید؟ پروپای جی Alright um, So that's, that's the source of this was only duality and there is the following fact Uh, there is a unique connected one connected was only group. Uh, let's call it G star such that um, first of all, its Lie algebra is equal to the space G star together with this new Lie bracket. And second, if you take the corresponding Poisson bracket and you take a similar first order term, then it will be equal to the Lie bracket map. Of G. Right. Sorry to insist, uh, Vladimir, could you uh, could you turn off your mic? Because I, I'm a little bit disturbed by those uh, background noises. Um, right. So, um, thank you. Okay. Um, right. In fact, uh, you can also go the other way around. And uh, starting from G star, you can reconstruct back your G. So it's a kind of involution. Of course, maybe your G was not simply connected. Then this operation would reconstruct for you the universal color of G, which is also a Poisson Lie group. Right. So um, what we are interested in is what happens for G compact. Oops, sorry, my color code. So for G compact. Mm. So here, the general story is like this. Um, let's consider the complexification of G. This is a complex reductive Lie group and it admits the Ivasava decomposition. So here N is the maximal nilpotent of GC. And AN and A is the exponential of I times T. So, so each element of GC has a unique decomposition of this type and actually in any order. So here I wrote it in some particular order, but um, it works in any order. Now it turns out that G star is equal to A N. Easily group. Uh, perhaps it's also nice to note that G star is isomorphic to GC mod G. So that's because you can have this GN decomposition in any order. I can write G on the right instead of writing it on the left. And um, so this implies the, there is an action. of G on G star. So we have a map G, sorry. So we have a map G times G star to G star. Uh, note that this is a Poisson map. This is a Poisson map, where here we have 
the Poisson bracket phi g star. And here we have the Poisson bracket on the product phi g plus phi g star. In particular, it's interesting that um, um, the G action does not preserve the Poisson bracket by G star, right? Because in order to preserve it, this would mean that uh, this action map G times G star to G star, this map should be Poisson map with PG equals zero, right? That would means preserve. But now it does not preserve it. Sorry, let me reorient the camera. Uh, so it does not preserve it exactly because of this, um, of this phi G, extra phi G. So this notion of Poisson actions, it was pioneered by Drinfeld and then by Semyonov Tenshansky. But this particular example, this was considered in detail by Lou and Weinstein. Okay. So um, perhaps to make it a little bit more concrete, let me mention an example. And I, I told you my examples will be very unexcited, unexciting today. So G will be equal to UN. And uh, so in this case, G star is what? So, uh, so these are upper triangular matrices with diagonal entries, positive reals, and upper triangular entries complex numbers. So this is clearly a uh, L group. So um, I will now describe for you in the general case, the Poisson structure on G star. Uh, so this is the theorem of Lu, And it says the following. So phi G star, is the unique by vector such that the following beautiful formula holds true. So you take phi G star and you take a pairing, say on the first factor, uh, with the one form on G star, which works as follows. I put a Maurer Cartan form, which takes values in G star, and I take a pairing with some element of X. And on the right hand side, I put a fundamental vector field for the G action on G star, which was defined above. So you see, it's a, it's a very, very economic, very beautiful formula. And you see that that's now that's clear why I didn't bother to tell you more about the standard Poisson structure on G because now uh, indirectly I described it. And in any event, we would be more interested in G star in the dual Poisson group. And for that dual Poisson group, here is a very, very simple, very concise description. Of course, I'll tell you many more things about this pi G star, maybe more than you want to know. We'll see. So, um, what does it so mean to say that X? You written X in X on the on the second. Oh, that's right. Sure. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Yeah, X is in G, right? So that's and this works for all X in G, right? Thank you. Exactly. Right. And the right hand side is the vector field which it defines by this action. Yeah, right. So X is an element of the Lie algebra G. It defines a fundamental vector field because we have an action. And on the other hand, if we take, a, say, here it's a right invariant Maurer Cartan form on G star, uh, it defines for us a, a scalar valued R valued one form. And uh, we can uh, insert it in the first. Uh, 
uh, in the first input place of the bivector, this would give us a vector field, and those two vector fields should be the same. Thanks. Right. Thank you. And uh, so, in fact, it gives you, since, uh, in fact, those one forms, they span the cotangent space at each point, and therefore, this formula defines a unique bivector. And it turns out that this bivector is exactly the pi g star. Right. So maybe one more, one more example that we'll be, we'll, we'll be using from time to time. So the uh, one of the easiest examples possible. Um, so example, um, G equal to SU2, but I kind of promise even with SU2 today, we're gonna have some fun. It's, it's a very simple example, but it's already giving you some impression of how it works. So, so these are elements Um, uh, so these are elements of G star. So these are upper triangle matrices. There are positive reals now since it's SU2, the determinant will be one. So these are positive reals on the diagonal. These are complex numbers as an off diagonal element. And but we are thinking of it as a real Lie group. Uh, so now, what is the Poisson bracket? Phi G star. Well, it is a, a log canonical bracket for A and B. Uh, since we are, we are thinking of it as a real group, uh, we should also say what is the bracket for B bar. And as you can expect, it is something like this. And then an interesting one is B with B bar. And sorry. And it looks like this. For now, it looks like just some random expression, but uh, we'll see that it's an interesting one. And of course, probably all of you, or most of you, know what uh, about one group. So this should be, this is a kind of semi classical version of UQSO2. Right. Okay, perfect. So I think that's about it. What I wanted to tell you to start with about Poisson Lie groups. Logically, now it would be better to, to, to speak about uh, cluster coordinates on G star and about tropicalization. However, all the motivation of the method comes from a different topic, which is which goes under the name of Ginsburg Weinstein isomorphism. And that's why I decided, so you see, I, I will break the logic a little bit. I will first speak about Ginsburg Weinstein, and then we go into uh, cluster coordinates and into tropicalization. I hope it's it's okay for you, but just, just to tell you that uh, then later on, we will return to, to, to this topic. And um, so um, basically just to tell you why, because well, yes, we have this new formula, which is a very nice formula, but still it's not sufficiently concrete. We want more, we want to know more about pi G star. And we're gonna learn through Ginsburg Weinstein, more about pi G star and through those cluster story, even more about pi G star. So, so today we're gonna, we're gonna learn lots of things about pi G star. Okay, so um, let me call it part five. So the Ginsburg Weinstein isomorphism. Um, but I will start. Um, I'll start with the uh, following remark. Um, so um, G star is actually isomorphic to G is a G space. 
Uh, and of course, this is because of um, the invariant scalar product. So we can choose an invariant scalar product. Perhaps there are many, perhaps there is essentially only one, but uh, we can choose a scalar product and we can identify as G spaces, G and G star. So then uh, we can build the following map. Let's call it alpha. So it is identifying G star with G. And then I will be taking X and mapping it to exponential of I X. So this is in GC. And now I can project to GC mod G. And this is isomorphic to G star. So in this way, I get a map alpha from just small G star to capital G star. And um, I learned it from uh, Semyon Tinshansky. So um, I usually call it the STS map. I don't know whether it was known before, perhaps. I don't know. And uh, this is a G equivariant diffeomorphism. So alpha identifies G and G star as uh, uh, G spaces. Now, um, and you see, this is a very explicit or relatively explicit map, relatively understandable map. So sorry, is, I'm sorry. it identifies G star and G star, you mean? Yes, sorry, yeah. It identifies G star and G star. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So now, um, there is a theorem of Ginsburg and Weinstein. And this theorem says that actually, uh, G star together with its Poisson bracket by G star is isomorphic to small G star with pi KKS as Poisson spaces. And if you're going to denote those Gisbrook Weinstein maps by gamma. Now, um, so we're going to discuss in detail this theorem. Um, so here is a remark. Um, recall that um, the action G cross G star to G star does not preserve by G star. Uh, but at the, at the same time, we know that the coil joint action does preserve the KKS Poisson bracket, right? So, so here there is a difference. And this implies that in any event, there are no G variant Poisson diffeomorphisms. Um, from small G star to capital G star. So this, this is simply ruled out. So you see we have the, this map alpha, this very concrete map, which is uh, a G equivariant diffeomorphism. And now Ginsburg Weinstein theorem says that they exist, uh, that they exist, maybe I should say, Uh, they exist uh, um, Poisson diffeomorphisms, but uh, we already know that two conditions one cannot combine. So maybe another remark. So there are, uh, it's, it's relatively obvious that there are many Ginsburg-Weinstein maps. 
And this is because we can uh, pre or post compose with uh, automorphisms of uh, the Poisson spaces G and G star, right? So you can you can act by groups of Poisson diffeomorphisms, whatever they are. We don't quite know what they are, but for sure they exist and they're huge. They act on uh, small G star and on capital G star, and you can get new ginsburg Feinstein maps if you already have one. Okay. So um, perhaps uh, an example. So just, just to say those ginsburg weinstein maps, they're not so easy to construct. Uh, and perhaps we'll now see a little bit why, but for G equal to SU2, there is a very explicit formula and I want to show it to you. So suppose we um, take a Hermitian two by two matrix this trace zero. So that's an element of um, small G star. And now the question is where gamma would map it. And here is the answer. Uh, to write that answer, I would need a little bit of notation. So I'll say X plus I Y is rho times uh, e to the power I phi. So I would need a polar presentation and I would need the notation R square for the sum of squares of coordinates X, Y, and Z. So this is actually a copy of R3 that we have here. Um, and well, here we put E to the power Z, E to the power minus Z, zero. And here, some kind of funny expression. Well, it's not too scary, but it's an SU2 example. And you know, like kind of it's already doesn't look very attractive, right? So this, um, this part. Um, so um, one can say that also in the case of G equal to UN, there are some less explicit, but still more or less explicit formulas. And this is due to my ranking and myself. Um, right. So um, now, so that's an interesting, that's the, the next thing is a kind of interesting story. You know, I think this uh, Ginsburg-Weinstein theorem is a big theorem. And one of the char characteristic properties of big theorems, they, they have many different proofs. For instance, if you search on the internet for the proofs of the Pythagoras theorem, certainly you will find whatever, like, I don't know, 20, 30, I mean, many, many, many different proofs. Well, okay, Ginsburg-Weinstein theorem is another geometric theorem, admittedly, maybe not as fundamental as the Pythagoras theorem, but still it has many proofs, which are done by different technologies. Let me list at least some of them. So the original proof of uh, Ginsburg and Weinstein, it uses some kind of chemology argument. And then there is the Moser lemma proof uh, that I gave some years ago, and I will tell you a little bit about that proof. So then um, there is a proof using dynamical R matrices. And this is due to Enriquez Ettingoff and Marshall. And then uh, there is a proof using 
genital twists. And these are the same authors. And then uh, there is a proof that uh, Sasha Shapira mentioned in his uh, lecture yesterday, this uses Stokes matrices. And this is due to Philip Bow. Uh, probably there are other proofs. Sorry if I'm, I'm not listing, but at least these are, these are uh, proofs that I remember uh, on the top of my head. And um, so I will, I will tell you a little bit about this Mohs lemma. And I will mention just the principle of how this one works and possibly Shao Meng Shu, perhaps he, he, he mentions related things uh, in his Friday, in his Friday talk. Right. Okay, so um, in order to discuss this Mosalem proof and also for the future use, uh, we'll need the following idea of scaling. So the observation is um, very, very simple. So let's consider a map from G star to this pi KKS. And uh, it will be going to G star, this Poisson bracket, which is pi KKS scale. So S is a non-vanishing real number. And the map is simply the scaling map. So I multiply X by this number S. And then it turns out that this map is Poisson. You can easily check it, right? Pi KKS is linear. So it's clear that uh, uh, the, this, this transformation of pi should be homogeneous. So it can be either multiplying by S or by S minus one. It turns out it's multiplication by S. I every time get confused, but you can check. I think I, I verified again for this, for, for this talk. So it is actually multiplication by S. Okay, so now let's play the following game. Um, so um, so, um, so this is just to give you an idea of the Moselle proof. proof. Um, so it, uh, it goes as follows. So let's uh, compose the scaling map with the semenov tinshansky map. So let's call it alpha S. So alpha S identifies G star with capital G star. So this identification now depends on S. Uh, so usually we don't pull back by vectors, but if uh, the map is a diffeomorphism, we can of course pull back. This just means push forward under the inverse map. So we get uh, by S, a family, family of by vectors. Now on small G star. So we, we are now working on small G star. So we now can forget capital G star because we imported the corresponding Poisson bracket to a small G star. Now there is an interesting fact, which perhaps not entirely obvious. Um, we can take a limit of this family when S goes to zero. Um, so I probably many of you know what the answer is gonna be. Already it's somewhat surprising that the limit exists, right? But, uh, but it does. Uh, so uh, do, 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 do people know what's gonna be on the right hand side? Uh, you can you can type in the chat or you can answer. 
I just want a little bit more interaction with you. So I'm, I'm a bit sad that you're silent. So then someone who knows, tell me. People, I want some reaction from you. Well, okay, so um, um, I think it, it's kind of sort of surprising. Uh, uh, actually, pi kks is simply part of that family. So if you send s to zero, then uh, you will recover, you will recover pi kks. Um, do, you, right. can you, do you know what? Um, do you have a formula for alpha star of pi g without s for s equals one? Oh, I mean, uh, not really. That's, that's something gonna horrible. Be, okay. Yeah, that's that's a priori. That's going to be something uh, really cumbersome. Uh, yeah, you see, we'll we'll um, we'll see some. We'll okay. I'll give you some information about it. Uh, later, but let's say not for, for s equal one, I really don't know. Uh, so s, s going, going to zero, that's, that's kind of a small perturbation of pi uh, kks. Uh, for s going to infinity, that's going to be also something more or less tractable, as you'll see. And for the su2 case, kind of uh, more or less on the next page, I'll give you the formula so you can appreciate how it looks like for any S. But yeah, in principle for S equal one, well, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is something. Um, G star coordinates, small G star coordinates, linear coordinates are not extremely well adapted for expressing it. Yes, there is something. Okay. Okay. So, um, now, um, uh, so one, so, some more facts. So you have a limit. So symplectic leaves. Uh, simply quadrant orbits for all values of S. Of course, we, we knew it for s equals zero, but it turns out it's the same for all values of s. So at least the leaves, they remain the same. And now perhaps it's a bit easier to state it in terms of uh, symplectic forms. Suppose we chose some leaf, and then we have a family of uh, symplectic forms on the leaf. It turns out that with this operation, the cohomology class of the symplectic form is independent of S. So it's always the same as the cohomology class of uh, omega KKS. So then this means that by Mosel lemma, you can, uh, you have a diffeomorphism which transforms omega s to omega kks. And it, it requires a little bit more work to show that this diffeomorphism can be, can be made smooth for all symplectic leaves, but they combine into a nice diffeomorphism of small g star. But um, so that's already technicality. Right, so that's that's roughly speaking how it works. Uh, note though that um, it doesn't look like a procedure that's going to give you a formula, right? So whenever you have a Mosel lemma, this means you need to integrate a vector field. So it um, it's not it's not a very formula oriented story. Now I should probably ask you again. Uh, so, do you want a break, or should we continue? I will be happy to continue, but I mean, uh, people tell me. I, I may, maybe the, the the organizers, Leonid, what's your order? Um, yeah. <coughs> uh. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would. I would continue, but. Uh... Yeah. yeah, yeah. I no, I'm happy to continue. So, people on the chat seem to support it. Okay, sure. Yeah, let's let let let's let's continue. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Um, so, so now let me let me give you an example. As usual, it is G equal to SU two, and I think it's sort of uh, even though the example is very simple, you will see it's kind of interesting. So we have. We have uh, G star, the dual space of the Lie algebra, it's simply a copy of R3, quadrant orbits the spheres. So my drawing doesn't make it very spherical, but well, sorry about that. So let's say it's a sphere of radius R. And on this sphere of radius R, uh, we have a two form which depends on S. So the KKS form omega naught, this is simply the area form on the sphere. And here, here is the expression. So uh, for the um, for the general case, so this is a sine hyperbolic of 2SR. This is a constant, by the way, right? R is just the radius of the sphere. Here R cosine hyperbolic 2SR minus Z sine hyperbolic 2SR. And this is all multiplied by omega naught. So in, in this case, you see it's, uh, th there is some, basically some linear function. And uh, here it's interesting to think what if S is very large? So what happens when S is very large? Uh, so, um, so then uh, basically what happens, uh, you, you can easily check that uh, basically all the volumes, it will be concentrating in the small neighborhood of the North Pole. So that's when R minus Z becomes small, right? So at that point, you will have some huge volume concentration. So the integral of omega S over the sphere is always equal to the integral of omega naught. So the total area doesn't change. However, the volume concentration or the area concentration happens in the uh, in a small neighborhood of that point. So, and we'll see, we'll, we'll be discussing um, this phenomenon later on. In fact, um, this is also known in the general case, at least for those regular orbits. So this is due to Hoffman, Lane, Lee and myself. Uh, and um, here, regular, a regular orbit. Is isomorphic to GC mod B and it admits a decomposition. Uh, into um, how it's called. Brewer cells. And uh, the, similarly, we know that the volume, it goes to the smallest, it goes to the neighborhood, neighborhood of, of the smallest cell. So it, it always kind of, uh, if, if, you, if you make S large, then it will be all falling on that point. Uh, I, I'm not sure that B, I, B is what you called G star before. I don't think you've called no. B. I don't think you've mentioned B earlier, but it's the same as G no. star, isn't it? isn't it? No, I think B is, uh, is a complex, is a Borel. So 
and in in G star. Yeah, you yeah, understand. Okay. Restricted yeah. A to mm -hmm. be. Yes. Real. Yeah. Right. So it's it's not quite the same, but now we are discussing just one, just one orbit, right? So 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 this 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 is just one quadrant orbit. Okay. You can you can, you can say that this is um, G mod T or G C mod B. Right. Uh, okay. So now one more thing I want to discuss about the scaling. Uh, so let me do the uh, scaling of Ginsburg Weinstein. And that's something that we'll need later on. Uh, so um, now I will take a composition, gamma S, of the scaling map uh, with the map gamma. So this will be a Poisson diffeomorphism from G star pi KKS to capital G star. And here uh, note that uh, uh, this uh, scaling map, it multiplies the KKS uh, Poisson bracket by this factor S. And then uh, gamma maps pi KKS to pi G star. So we are getting the scaled, the scaled Poisson uh, bracket on uh, pi G star. So in the example of G equal to SU2, So this gamma S map, it looks as follows. And this will be good for our intuition later on, later today and tomorrow. So this, is, this goes to exponential of SZ. And here will be these, those, this uh, funny expression, but everything is scaled by S. One half e to the power i phi e to the power minus s z, right? Okay. Okay. So um, I think for now that's all what I wanted to tell you about Ginsburg-Weinstein. And um, now the last topic for today is. Cluster coordinates and tropicalization. Right. And uh, I hope we'll end up today with some interest, at least interesting result, interesting looking result. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I warned you before that actually this Ginsburg Weinstein was breaking the logic a little bit, not completely, but uh, we're basically now uh, returning to the setup uh, which that we had before Ginsburg Weinstein. So we, we have this Poisson-only group, G star, we have a loo description. Uh, oh, can S be zero? Oh, okay. So, sorry, so there is a question on the chart about zero and non-zero. Uh, good question. So in the beginning, so let me, yeah, let, let me run back. That, that's a, an important question. So, um, right, in the beginning, uh, I told you that S was non-zero because I do the scaling. But it turns out that uh, a posteriori, when you, uh, when you define uh, the family, it turns out that, uh, for instance, this omega s. Let's define omega s for s non-zero, right? But then it turns out that it has a limit when s goes to zero, and that limit is simply the KKS form. Uh, I can also say here omega KKS instead of omega zero. But for instance, the formula will show that if you take the S to zero limit, 
uh, you will get back uh, you will get back omega KKS, right? Because the sine hyperbolic here will be zero in the denominator, uh, the cosine hyperbolic will be one, and the limit of sine hyperbolic of 2SR over 2S will be R, which will cancel R in front of the cosine hyperbolic. So the limit simply exists, and it turns out to be equal to omega KTS. Is it a good answer, Conway? Uh, yes, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mm, uh, uh, all right, so, so what I wanted to say, we, we now in the framework uh, before, uh, before all this Ginsburg Weinstein. And uh, so we want to know more about pi g star. So I will now tell you more about pi g star. So um, let's, um, let's go here. So cluster coordinates in tropicalization and um, I will show you the coordinates that we plan to use in a very particular example. However, it will be clear that you can do it for any compact case. So let me write it in the case of uh, G equal to U3. So let's uh, put separately the diagonal part. And here we are putting a product of so-called Jacobi matrices, for instance, this product, uh, right? And you uh, repeated the F twice. The F one and the D one are the same. So I think you want to. Uh, the third matrix. I'm good. I'm, oh yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I think that's that. That's simply correct. So yeah, okay. no worries. Understand. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, no worries. No worries. Yeah. Thank you. But it's not a mistake. That's how okay. it should be. And actually, um, uh, so this particular expression, it corresponds to some uh, reduced expression for the longest word uh, in the Val group. So here it is S2, S1, S2. And uh, maybe you see that uh, this guy corresponds to the uh, simple root alpha two. This one also corresponds to the simple root alpha two. And that's because we have uh, two reflections as two in this expression. And uh, E corresponds to, to S1. So in general case, you evacuate the Kirtan part and then for each uh, reduced expression for W naught, you can write such a formula. And uh, it turns out that uh, this is a dense coordinate chart on G star. So this introduces for you some particular coordinates. Um, it's also interesting that um, you can choose uh, equivalent coordinate chart. It will be a monomial transformation using the minus of your matrix A. So let me, in this case, write down for you. So we are six dimensional, right? So this is a six dimensional space. And alternatively, you can choose the following coordinates. Uh, even, so I will choose six minus and um, so that, this, this we learned from Fermin Zelevinsky. Uh, so, I mean, I uh, write the answers and uh, for those of you who never seen such a thing, I let you check. That's kind of uh, very interesting that you are getting six minus which are monomial in terms of those so-called factorization parameters. So, a, B, D, E, and finally just the determinant. Right, so these are, these are six minus. So these are minor coordinates, let's say minor coordinates. And here, these are factorization. Um, 
parameters. All right. So what's uh, what, what's good about all that? So there is the following theorem um, due to Kogan and Zelivinsky. In fact, I think they are rich, originally their theorem applies more like to the Poisson bracket, standard Poisson bracket on G, but I want to turn it into a statement about G star. And uh, it says the following that the Poisson brackets of minus are log canonical, which means that there will be some, uh, some number C, which depends on the minus times the product of minus. Log canonical. Of this particular minors, yes? Uh, of actually of any minus, but of this, uh, wait, what I'm saying. Yes, and in fact of, uh, in fact of uh, all the minus, but of this particular, but let's say, I wanna show why it works for those particular minus. Yes, I think the theorem, as far as I recall, applies to uh, all the minus, right, okay. But for the, let's say for this, I, my, my, I, I want to show you I, the idea of the proof for those particular minors. Any matrix elements are also minors, yes? Sorry? Any matrix elements are also minors. Absolutely, yes. Yes, you're right. All the matrix elements are also minors. Uh, let me see, wait, 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 wait. No, okay, no, let's say for, the, for this particular minus, sorry, my, my apologies, yeah. It's nonsense what I'm saying, yeah. For this particular minus. So I, I chose some uh, presentation and I chose some particular minus, right? Which are monomials in terms of factorization parameters, right? For this particular minus. Um, yeah, thank you. Good. Yeah, for all minus, uh, these, the, 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 uh, there is the semenov tinshansky formula, which says that this is a quadratic bracket in general. But uh, so this means that the bracket of minus is a linear combination of products of uh, pairs of minus. But uh, that this is log canonical. I think this, yeah, this uh, this would work for for this particular minus. So um, so what's the idea of proof? Right. So um, recall that G star is a Poisson group. Uh, and this means that the product map is a Poisson map. It turns out that um, uh, this uh, U, U3 star, it has Poisson Lee subgroups, U2 star, which look as follows. Let me, let me go to SU3 to simplify things. So it has the following Poisson Lee subgroups. Sorry. So each of them is a Poisson Lee subgroup. Now it is easy to check that um, in uh, SU2 star, and that we already seen, so the bracket of AI and BI is something like imaginary unit times AI, BI, right? That's, that, that was just that basic example. And if you take Poisson brackets between different copies, they vanish. So, um,
So these brackets are log canonical. And if you think about it, what's the difference between this expression and the expression that I started with, this expression for A? Well, I just factorized the Cartan part to the left. So from, uh, from this expression to that expression up there, uh, sorry, you doesn't follow too well, yeah. So from the expression that you see at the top of the screen to the expression with a product of three copies, well, it's simply a monomial transformation. So you have something which is log canonical, you do a monomial transformation, you remain log canonical. But- Anton, uh, Sorry, can, Anton, can you just confirm, are you saying that A, A1 and B1 commute with A2 and B2 and so on? Yeah. Yes, I do. Zero plus on brackets between them. Yeah, they, they vanish. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. The Poisson, yeah, I just take, uh, I'm saying that uh, the map of uh, G star times G star times G star to G star is Poisson. And I have uh, the smaller Poisson, dual Poisson D group, H star, H star, H star which is sitting inside. So all the maps are Poisson. All the maps are Poisson. So, uh, right? You're also, they, saying that the, you're also saying that the different copies of H have, uh, they don't, they don't yeah. they have zero Poisson brackets between them. Yes, absolutely. Because the statement, um, the statement at the top was saying that, uh, pi g star in the first copy plus pi g star in the second copy plus pi g star in the third copy was mapping to pi g star on the product, right? So that was the Poisson Lee uh, mantra. Now, uh, inside I have this pi h star one plus pi h star two plus pi h star three. And so uh, mm -hmm. just, just since these are post only subgroups, this, uh, each of them maps to the corresponding pi g star. So yeah. the sum of three of them maps to the sum of sure. three okay. pi g stars. And so every, mm -hmm, everything is Poisson. Yeah. And now all the changes of variables, all the transformations, both reshuffling the Cartan part to the left is a monomial transformation. And the change of variables between uh, factorization parameters and minus is a monomial transformation. Mm -hmm. So if it was log canonical in the beginning, it will remain log canonical. Uh, of course, you see the, uh, in the beginning, different factors, they simply had vanishing Poisson brackets between each other. Uh, all the Poisson brackets between different factors, they come from reshuffling the diagonal to the left. That's it. So you conjugate with the diagonal, the diagonal cat non-trivial Poisson brackets with each factor. So there will be, um, so that's, that's the whole source of those log canonical Poisson brackets in, um, in the carbon Zelivinsky story. So that's a very beautiful, I would say, rather unexpected fact. Uh, so of course, I didn't give you any complicated uh, description of pi g star. If you kind of that's that's because I'm trying to be a good teacher and avoid avoid complications. Maybe that's wrong. No, no, it's interesting. Uh, but uh, but but it's a very interesting fact about. Um, mm -hmm about pi g star. Now, uh, however, I should say, let me add a remark. That probably you should also compare with the mini course of Sasha Shapiro. Uh, so um, if you consider Poisson brackets, remember some of the minus they are uh, they are real, but some of the minus they're actually complex value. 
So if you consider a Poisson bracket of, uh, uh, of a minor and of some minor complex conjugate, here you can possibly have this log canonical term. But you can also have uh, lots of other stuff. And the standard example, as usual, coming from the SU2 case, that would be remember, there was that bracket, BB bar. Uh, these are among those minus. And um, remember, the answer was something like this. So this doesn't look log canonical. Right. And in fact, we shouldn't be too disappointed because uh, um, uh, kind of over the next 15 minutes, I will show you a very interesting theorem which uses this fact. So in fact, it's not only bad, it's also good that there are no log canonical parts. Okay, so um, so let me uh, explain the last part of the preparation. So this goes under the name of tropicalization. And then I'll state the theorem. So tropicalization is the following change of variables. Uh, so let me recall that um, we have um, this um, parametrization. I think I have to uh, write it once again. One, 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 F. So such parametrizations exist for, for arbitrary type. And now I want to make the following change of variables. So um, uh, let me write it in this way. So I will consider again some parameter S, which is not zero. Um, um, so I just for, for real for real metric centuries, I'm just replacing them by exponential of S times something. And for other metrics entries, I parameterize them like this. And of course, this excludes the value of D equals zero. So, so this transformation, it does not apply everywhere, but it excludes some uh, negligible, some measure zero part. So here, of course, we assume D is not equal to zero and so on. Right. So I will call, um, I will call these parameters Zeta one, Zeta n, where uh, n is equal to dimension of G plus rank of G over two. And those phi's, I will call phi one, phi m, and m will be dimension of G minus rank of G over two. So you can check that in, in our, I think in our case, it should, uh, should work. So for U3, dimension of G, uh, uh, dimension of uh, G is nine, rank of G is three. So nine plus three is 12, and this is equal to, to six. I think this, uh, this should be fine. And uh, nine minus three is six divided by two is three. I think that this is this is this is the right count. So you have three real parameters, three complex parameters. So that that looks good. Um, okay. Right. Um, and that's that's all what I. So this is a strange change of variables, but that's all what I wanted to say for now about tropicalization. And now I'm ready to state to state an interesting theorem. So it's going to be a relatively long statement. So, 
So this is due to uh, Hoffman, Lane, Lee, and myself. Uh, and okay, it says the following one. There is a unique cone, or maybe we can say polyhedral cone. Cone C contained in R to the N. Uh, or maybe maybe let me enumerate after that, such that. And here there will be several, several features. So one. Um, so we consider the Poisson bracket S pi G star in the coordinate system in the coordinate system zeta one, zeta n, phi one, phi m. Note that we are using s two times. Once we multiply pi g star by s, but we're also using s in the definition of the coordinate system. I'm just saying it so as uh, the statement comes with less of a surprise. So we want to know what happens with this Poisson bracket if S send if we send S to infinity. Of course, if you don't use this S dependent coordinate system, S pi G star simply blows up, right? So you multiply by something which tends to infinity. But it turns out that here it tends to the limit. Let's call it pi infinity, which is a constant. Poisson bracket, um, right? Um, and um, so this uh, uh, this applies. So this statement applies if zeta coordinates belong to the interior of this unique cone. So it doesn't always happen, but it happens if zetas are in some region. So number two, so this bracket pi infinity, it has the form pi j, which are just constants, right? This is a constant Poisson bracket. D over d zeta i, d over d phi j. So there are no zeta zeta or phi phi brackets. So this is a bracket between only zetas and phi's. Uh, and it is clear that by some linear transformation, you can bring it to the uh, Darbu form, right? So they're, they're now not doing it explicitly, but uh, it's, it's clear. So these are constants, right? Um, Okay, so now number three. So, um, so this bracket by infinity, it has Casimir functions. Let's call them C. And they can be arranged into a map from uh, R to the N to the um, positive wild chamber of the uh, maximum torus. So you can you kind of, there is a number of linear functions which are Casimir for this pi infinity and they're all functions of, uh, of zetas. So there are no functions of phi's and those linear functions can be arranged all in a map to T plus star. So, um, and the final statement. So the Casimir functions only depend on the zetas? Yes, they only depend on zetas. Yeah, maybe I should write it. Only depend on zetas. 
And uh, so Rn is a space of zetas. And those functions can be, these are linear functions, and they can be arranged into a map to T plus star. So uh, the leaves. Um, let me say C minus one of some lambda. So lambda is a is uh, is a value of all of those Casimir functions. So we fix all of them, and the leaf is isomorphic to a polytop inside C inside R n. So polytop. Times the torus of uh, dimension m. So these are this is, this is just the torus of all those angles. And uh, fi the final statement: the volume of the leaf under the uh, symplectic structure pi infinity, which is the inverse of uh, sorry omega infinity, which is naturally the inverse of pi infinity, is equal to the volume of the corresponding quadrant orbit under the AKS bracket. Well, this is a kind of lengthy statement, a sort of surprising statement. Um, tomorrow we'll start with that statement and look at, at it and look at its consequences and what it gives us what kind of information it gives us about Ginsburg Weinstein, what information it gives us about quadrant orbits, what uh, information it gives us about capital G star. I would like just to end with a picture. Um, so, so how does it all look like? Uh, again, that's, uh, that's a difficult drawing, right? So let me illustrate it. So that's the cone C, which is sitting inside of Rn. Um, here is the torus Tm, right? Now, um, 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 let me choose a different color. Here is the polytop delta lambda sitting inside C. And um, I suggest, uh, I suggest, so, so and this is uh, now delta lambda times Tm with the symplectic leaf. Uh, oh, there was a question. Yeah, let me answer that question in a second. Let me finish the drawing. So, um, so delta lambda times the torus, that's the symplectic leaf of the constant Poisson structure, pi infinity. Right? But now in the same coordinates, we can draw a symplectic leaf of the symplectic structure omega s or of the Poisson structure, pi s, better say. So uh, how does, does it look like for final, very large but finite s? It's difficult for me to draw in this multidimensional space so I will draw some kind of approximation. So the symplectic leaf, so this is a symplectic leaf for S large. So of course, I'm not able to draw the, the, uh, the, the, the torus, uh, directions but i think it's it's all or probably just all the torus but here here there is some some kind of curve uh, which passes uh, in the place inside the cone it is very close to delta lambda for s large but it also goes very much outside so then what does it mean how this is possible well it turns out that um, the the two form or you can say symplectic volume uh, 
symplectic volume flows towards this part, which gets closer and closer to delta lambda. We actually don't quite know how the symplectic leaf behaves outside that region. But inside the cone, it gets closer and closer to delta lambda, and the two form all the, all the volume flows to that region. Uh, actually, just to tell you, we've already seen this picture once today. Let me, let me briefly remind you. So that was this, uh, well, it's a bit slow. We'll see it now. Yes, that's this picture. Actually, this is the same picture, but in a different coordinate system, right? So here as well, this symplectic volume was flowing to some very, very small neighborhood around, uh, around the North Pole, right? Well, uh, actually, this picture that I'm showing you here, it will now come. It's exactly the same picture, just this small neighborhood got resolved into this, uh, this red region or into delta lambda. So we've now chosen a better coordinate system. And in this coordinate system, we see this region. This region doesn't move that much. It doesn't shrink. And uh, we see all the volume, which is there. So that's, that's a, clearly a better picture. We're going to exploit it tomorrow. I think that's all what I wanted to say. In any event, for today, my time is up. And so the question on the chart was, does the Poisson structure in the theorem depend on the decomposition? Uh, a very good question. Uh, so um, in fact, let's say, uh, let's, uh, let's agree on the following. The uh, Poisson structure pi g star does not depend on any decomposition, right? It was given by the Lu formula. So it's a kind of God given Poisson structure on G star. So it was a dual to the more or less unique Poisson structure on the compact Lie group G. So this one does not depend. Uh, now pi infinity depends in the following sense. So you can choose different coordinate systems. Uh, pi infinity in all those, uh, if you change the, the decomposition of W naught, you will get a, a different pi infinity. They're all in some sense isomorphic. Why I'm, why I'm a bit kind of hesitant to say it or why I'm a bit cautious to say it, that's because the transformation between different charts after you pass to a tropical limit becomes uh, on the uh, um, uh, on, 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 on zetas, it becomes uh, piecewise linear. And on phi's, a priori, it's dis discontinuous. It has jumps. Uh, however, such a funny transformation, it maps a constant Poisson structure to a constant Poisson structure. So that's the, there is a kind of, some kind of hidden miracles in the picture. Uh, I didn't want to attract your attention to, to those complications, but since you asked the question, well, I probably, I, I'm bound to say the truth. So that's the truth. May, maybe in tomorrow I can say more about it, but, but you're right. That's an interesting, well, it's an interesting question. So pi infinity, they, they will be all isomorphic, but you need to, uh, but, but those isomorphisms they will be some kind of tropical isomorphisms. In particular, they are not always, uh, they're, they're not everywhere continuous maps. They are continuous on open dense subsets, but not everywhere. All right, so I, I think uh, on my side, that's it uh, for today. I would be happy to have uh, more questions or comments. Uh, thank you. Um, uh... Well, maybe uh, a bit philosophical question, but uh, uh, is there any quantum counterpart of this picture? So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, some quantum uh, uh, integrable system like 
maximum commutative subalgebra in the UQ corresponding to this? Yeah, that um, that I uh, I don't quite know. I think maybe maybe on Friday maybe some... there, there there is such right because in type A you have been fun set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, but but I mean in general case I don't quite know. Maybe Shawman is better equipped to to answer like on Friday. Yeah, that we we, we made several attempts to 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 better understand it at least. Uh, as you see, this approach is sort of uh, geometric. Uh, of course, one would one would think that there should be uh, there should be something like that, something related to the uh, right this uh, this s to infinity limit. It's suppose it's it's a little bit strange, right? Maybe to a philosophical question, I can give a philosophical philosophical answer. Right? Let's say that Q is uh, exp something like exponential of s times uh, h bar mm -hmm. right so so then we have uq of g and uh we kind of uh, know very well that we can uh, we can send s to zero this would be q to one limit and uh, this would be a limit which sends it to just just to the enveloping algebra u of g, mm -hmm. right? And here uh, here we can still keep we can artificially keep h, right? If you want. So then we can send h bar to zero, and uh, we can go to the uh, um, to the Poisson geometry of g star with pi kks, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, so here you, uh, well, of course, what you can also do, you can first send h bar to zero and get Poisson geometry of G star. This uh, maybe you can say pi G star. And here the S to zero limit would be something that I was explaining, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. this is a reasonably, one can more or less make sense of this uh, um, commuting diagram. I mean, one, one would need to work. Now, what, what we are trying to do here is something like this. Uh, so, um, right, maybe I should. So, so, so we, we, still, we still take the h bar to zero limit and we obtain g star s pi g star. But now we are saying, let's send s to infinity. Uh, and here we're getting this uh, cone times the torus with pi infinity, more or less, right? That's, uh, that's one way to summarize the theorem. Now, uh, now we are trying to do something like this. We want first to take S to infinity limit and then H to zero limit, right? So, uh, and... Um, and, and of course, this, uh, this, this looks a lot more questionable, right? Because Q, where does it go, right? <laughs> who, who knows? I mean, you, you, you kind of, uh, you first want to make, this should be some Anton, kind you've of- You've got a relevant comment there from- Yes. In the chat, it's probably relevant. Oh, maybe, maybe it is exponential to minus SH. Or that doesn't matter so much, right? Zero or infinity for Q. I mean, it's, uh, it, I, I don't think it's gonna, yeah, it's, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's gonna change the picture much. So, it so, so it doesn't change the first picture, but it changes the second picture. No, I don't yeah. think so. I, I don't think it changes the second picture either, right? So in the second picture, Q instead of, uh, because lattice points in the cone will have some relation. Yeah, 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 right. So, so here there should be some crystal object. And I think there are papers which make part of that crystal object appear, but I don't know how to make all of it appear, right? Is it like, is it an algebra? Is it not an algebra? So as I say, to a philosophical question, a philosophical answer. Right. One needs to understand in which category uh, this uh, this object lives, and then probably it all makes sense. 
but uh, I would be a little bit lacking the definition. Well, oh, I, I see. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Look. Thanks a lot. Uh, and tomorrow, this will be Jeremy who will be starting. Okay. Uh, can, can you think, sorry, one more question. Can you think about the last point of a theorem about the volumes, as about yes. the kind of localization theorem? Uh, whether one can look, I think uh, it would be wonderful to prove it by localization theorem. That's, I think that that would be just, uh, just very good because at the moment, Maybe I mention it a little bit tomorrow, maybe not. At the moment, we are proving it with very, very heavy tools. Two heavy tools. It, I mean, it's, uh, I, I tried to uh, package it into some kind of light statement. So at the moment, well, it's a lengthy theorem, but sort of understandable and everything looks nice. However, the proof of four, it's a kind of, to be honest, it's a kind of horror story because it uses, whatever dual canonical basis, whatever counts and points in polytops. Uh, I think it's clearly for now proved with two heavy tools. And you're right, if we could have integrated, so, so basically this volume, right? This volume here is simply the Lebesgue volume of the polytop, uh, delta lambda times the volume of the torus, which is something like, depending on, um, depending on notation, but it's something like two pi to the power m. So, and of course the volume of a polytop, you would think that maybe you can just, uh, uh, just decide what it is if you know where the vertices are. And probably I would imagine this, this should be possible. This would, this would streamline a lot this proof. I, I, I agree, so that, that, that would be desirable, but that's not how we do it. And directly, I, I, to be honest, I don't quite know how to do it that way, but it must be possible. It should not be extraordinarily complicated, but well, I mean, so, so that's an open problem. Can I add a comment? I don't know if this is related to the question, but can I add a, a, a small comment? Of course. Yeah, I think I think this is one of the weird things. If you go back to the picture of the sphere with the the volume concentrating near the north pole. Oh wait, say it, it usually takes some time for the machines yes. for, for zoom to, to move. But yes. Sorry. Yeah. So 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 the the weird thing that happens as this volume concentrates is that it's concentrating in a smaller and smaller neighborhood of the north pole, but actually not at the North Pole. So it's more like an annulus, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, which so is, failed... which is... yeah let, me, let me redo the drawing. Yeah, J Jeremy is right. So in fact, yes. There which is kind of... Yeah, and the annulus is getting, I mean, this is just a slightly more detailed version of the picture, but the annulus is getting closer and closer to the North, North Pole, and the annulus is the part that's getting mapped to that piece in the cone, and it's very, very interesting. Yeah, that's correct. I failed to mention that uh, even like in a more detailed way, you see this collar, it has an S1 coordinate, which is the rotation, and it has a segment coordinate, and that would be our polytop. That's, that's true. Our polytop in this case is a segment. Yes, that's, that's a kind of funny, funny picture. That's true. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether there are any other questions or comments. So if not, say, thanks a lot. And uh, tomorrow it will be Jeremy who will start. And I think it's a di slightly different time, right? It's uh, one hour later, 5.15 Moscow time. Is it right? Yeah, it's, yeah that's right. So, uh, so Jeremy's talk will be one hour later. And, uh, and also the first talk tomorrow will be uh, Sash Shapiro on uh, 
3.30. Can, can you remind me how long, how long is my talk supposed to be? Uh, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's really uh, up. I, I mean, that's really up to you. Maybe when you have it planned, just, just let me know. I will, I, I mean, for me, I can fit into whatever interval you, you leave me. But 45 minutes? Well, between, let's say, in any event, between 45 and one hour, you decide. Okay. So, in fact, you both may ex extend your, your talks because uh, uh, the, the, there's no lecture after after yours. <laughs> oh, no, but come on, come on. Yeah, kind of uh, both us and the audience, right? They should still survive after all those talks. So, no, no. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. And thank you. And see you tomorrow. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you.